Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all of you who are here with us in person. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online, uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're listening on demand or watching on demand later. Uh, we're so grateful that we're spending some time together diving into God's word this morning. And so we are going to continue and actually close out our series this morning called Belief, looking at some of the basic understandings, the basic beliefs that Christians have held throughout the entirety of our faith. And so that's allowed us to maybe remind ourselves of things that are vitally important and that help us to then know what it is that we stand for in order to be a light in a dark place in a crooked and depraved generation to shine like stars and to do such, and to do such good deeds that people wouldn't give us credit, but would give God glory. And so as we enter into this final time together, uh, looking at this specific series, um, I want to share about how we're going to talk about the idea of life today and, you know, the idea of like, oh, like, what's the meaning of life? Like, we will all know in 33 minutes and 55 seconds. No, um, but recognizing that, you know, this past week we had a, a really great opportunity based on the generosity of my in-laws to be able to go and spend some time at Great Wolf Lodge in Anaheim. Has anyone heard of Great Wolf Lodge? Yeah, okay, good. So it's one of those, it's like a huge water park um, that's indoors. Uh, they have some really cool um, interactive things to do. Like there were, I don't know, just all these things everywhere. It's like a scavenger hunt inside. They have great food. They have uh, nice rooms. Like it's just a really great thing. So we hit a one day getaway to Great Wolf Lodge. We got down there a little bit early, got to use the water park um, kind of right when we got there, even before we checked in. And then uh, we were able to be there for about, it was just over 24 hours, about 25 hour trip total. And it was one of those where we got the girls what's called a pop pass. And what it was, you spent a little bit extra money, but it allowed for them to get like um, a free game that they're going to play and like a free wand that they were doing for one of their interactive games, uh, a f like a free like 12 ounce bag of candy. They didn't offer to give that to me. Um, they had like a free scoop of ice cream. They had, you know, all these different things and it kept like, adding on. So they got to like go and cross off. They got like little wolf ears. Um, it was just an entire like really fun thing. You pay a little extra and they got a little extra. And so... They enjoyed the trip. Um, we had a great time. We ended up leaving the next morning. And we're leaving, and it was like, Steph made the comment, because everything was indoors. She's like, we haven't been outside, like, in a day. <laughs> like, you just, you're everything. It's like your own world where you're living the life. It's like you have food when you want it. You get activities to do when you, what you want to do when you want to do them. It feels like, you know, everything you, you want is at your fingerprints, fingertips, excuse me, uh, for about 24-hour period. And yet, there was this moment like, oh, like, this is the life. Like, this is so fun. This is great. And yet, while we were there, you know, we didn't have our phones with us very much because we're in the water park. And so it wasn't until a little bit later that then we find out about the tragedy that happened in Texas. And you look at this and it's like, we could be in this bubble where it feels like we're living the life, that everything's great, that, that, oh my goodness, like this is all that we've ever wanted at our fingertips. And yet, at that very same time, there's tragedy that's striking across our country. And yet, we expand that to the whole world. We know that we may think or we may have moments where we feel like we're living a, the good life as the world may determine it. And yet, when we are faced with such tragedy, when we're faith with, faced with such difficulty, when we're faced with heartache and pain, we must know that there's more to this world than a paw pass at Great Wolf Lodge. We must know there's more to this world than just getting all the goodies that we want and eating what we want, when we want, and doing what we want. We must know that life, yes, we want to recognize that Jesus came to give us life and life to the full, but that doesn't mean full stomachs, it means full hearts. It means living a life that's eternal, that's now and forever, not just for today. And so I'm going to ask you, join me in a word of prayer. We're going to spend our entire time together in one verse, a verse that many of you are familiar with. Um, you've heard, you've seen different things like that. We're going to unpack it uh, for, for our time together this morning. But before we do, I'll ask that you join me in a word of prayer as we get ready for what God has for each and every one of us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who is um, part of our service today and listening to my voice right now. Whether it's live in person, live online, on demand at home, God, I pray that you would um, speak 
in a way that only you could speak to your children, to your people, the ones that you've created and formed, that you would meet us where we are today, wherever we are today. God, I pray that as, I, as we dive into your word, that I would decrease, that you would increase, that you would speak in a personal, powerful, impactful way to each and every one of us. Lord, we love you. We're grateful to you for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we're looking at this idea, we're going to be in John chapter 3, verse 16. I told you you're going to recognize the verse, and we're going to unpack that a little bit. Before we do, I want to close out as we're in this series called Belief that we've shared how we're looking at the scriptural foundation for basic beliefs. And so here is the Apostles' Creed that we've been kind of unpacking a little bit throughout this series, pointing to where the scripture unpacks and shows what this means. And so um, we talk about here, the Apostles' Creed starts off for the first week we talked about God, the Father. So it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Second week, we talked about God, the Son, and Jesus. It says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. We talked about that, that that word descended to hell. It means he actually died. He wasn't in a coma. He went into the realm of the dead. He didn't go to Gehenna, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He went into Hades, which is the idea of the realm of the dead. And so he actually did really and truly die. But that's not the end of the story. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That was our third week, unpacking that. And then we looked at the Holy Catholic Church and communicating that Catholic, and it's the word that means universal. So before it was Catholic versus Protestant, it was just the universal church. So another translation, another idea with this would just be the Holy Christian Church, the Holy United Church of the people of God. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so this is what we're going to land on on our final time together. That we talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We talk about um, the importance of forgiveness last week. And then today we're going to unpack the idea of everlasting life, of eternal life. And why is that so important? Not just for when we die, but what does that look like to change how we live? So Max Lucado wrote a book called The 316 Promise. And in that book, we're going to refer to it a couple times throughout our time together. But in in the description for that book or in the mindset behind the book. He has this quotation that for some of us, we, we know John 3.16 very well. Some of us may be less familiar than others, but here's what he says about it. He says, if you know nothing of the Bible, start here. John 3.16 invites you to know God's love deeply and intimately. And once you accept God's love, your life will never be the same. And then he says, if you know everything in the Bible, return here. Let John 3.16 become the banner of your life so much so that the message of God's unending and unbending love overflows from you to others. See, I remember John 3.16 when I I would uh, watch games on TV and there's always, there's some guy who would hold John 3.16 in the back of sporting events. You guys remember this? And so I would look it up and I remember looking it up and I was probably, I was probably like nine or 10 at the time and um, I, I read it, and to me, like, I just didn't even, I'm like, I don't get what, like, I don't get what the big deal is. Like, what is it? I don't, I don't understand it. It didn't connect. There, were, there, was a, there was a disconnect between the reality of the power of that verse, the 26 words, whatever it is, and how that impacts my life. But I just it didn't make that connection. But throughout my journey, as I start to understand who Jesus is, how this idea changes everything for that. So whether you're here and you think, oh my goodness, I came to service, and we're going to talk about John 3.16. I've heard that a thousand times, and I ask you, don't, don't check out right now. Don't, don't have like, okay, I know this, and just, you know, start like, I don't know, thinking of grocery lists or what you're going to do for Memorial Day tomorrow. Like, like stay with me today, because sometimes one of the dangers of having something so powerful become so familiar is that it then loses its power and its familiarity. And so when I have, you know, if I say, when I say to my wife or kids, hey, I love you, we could say it so often that it can almost, not not that it doesn't mean anything, but it's like, oh, I love you, I love you too, as opposed to like recognizing how deeply loved these kids are by us. Or when we say I'm praying for you, and it's like, no, 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 I am going to the Lord on your behalf and praying. It's not a flippant, you know, I'm praying for you, see you later. 
When we say, how, how are you doing as a greeting, we can say it flippantly. And, you know, if we say, hey, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, actually, I've got this huge rash right now. You know, like if people actually shared how they were doing, that's not true. That was just an example, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> um, but it's one of those where if we, if we actually shared that, then, you know, people are like, oh, I, like, I didn't really mean how are you doing. I just meant hi. And so what happens when things become familiar and sometimes they lose their power. So let's not lose sight of the power that comes in this most familiar verse for your life, for my life, and for the point of our sermon for eternal life. So the John 3, 16 promise book, I just wanted to show you uh, the book right here by Max Lucado. This is something that um, what I'm going to unpack, some of the content will, or some of the general ideas will come from this. I encourage you uh, to take the chance to read it if you are so interested in doing so. And so what he does here is he unpacks, um, even on that cover, you may not be able to see just because of the size of it, but he's got four simple statements that come straight from the passage, straight from the verse that we're going to unpack together this morning. So the first thing that he says is he loves. The idea that he loves. So who's the he? In this story, well, we know that as John 3.16 says, For God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So he, God, the God loves you. Now, this is the kind of thing that in its familiarity can often lose its power. Think about this. The same God who knows all the stars in the sky, the same God who knows them by name, the same God that holds all of creation and at the very power of his word saying, let there be light, all of a sudden there was creation. The same God who is so big and so vast and so magnificent that we cannot put it into proper words. And he's so vast and incredible and yet he knows you. He knows everything from the stars in the sky to the hairs on your head. He knows everything and he loves you. There are things that I'm like, God, I, I make mistakes. I, I don't have this all together. He's like, but God loves me and God loves you. That doesn't give us license to sin. It's an acknowledgement of where we're at and it shows that even with our faults, even with our brokenness, even when we aren't perfect, which is far more often than we want to admit, God loves you. If you walk out of this room or turn off the screen at the end of the service and you hear nothing else, but you have a, a better or a more clear understanding that God loves you, then this can be a powerful day for you. Because when the God of the universe, what is my, what, who, who is man, God, that you are mindful of him? And he knows the hairs on our heads, the days of our lives, the tears on our pillowcase, the cries of our heart. And he loves us. So may this not be a one in one ear and out the other kind of comment. Yeah, I love you. God loves you. No, no, no. He loves. He loves you so much. I remember when we first had our kids, it was just, we first had Shaylin, and I walked over uh, November 27, 2011, and I remember, um, you know, she gave, Steph gave birth, and um, I walked over to, to be able to, to meet Shaylin, and I just, if you've had these moments where you just walk over, and I just walked over to her, and um, like I just put my finger by her palm, and she just grabbed it, and I'm like, and ever since then, she's had me wrapped around her finger, right? Like, but it's just this moment of like, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, and she's probably like, you know, it's just this beautiful moment of like being so filled with love for, for something that was someone that was created and you don't even know how to put it into words. And, and it all started with the grasping of a finger or that moment. Eh, sorry, I loved her before. I'm not trying to say I didn't love her before, but that was the moment where it just became so real. And then you fast forward three years and eight months, and we're about to have our second daughter, Elise. And I remember thinking, and I was talking, I was leading a, um, a group of young dads who were in ministry at my old church, a small group of guys on staff. And we were just talking about, you know, what's it, what's it like to have, like when you have more kids, like how do you love 
more. You think, how can you love another child as much as you do your first? And I remember, again, Steph, uh, she had to have a C-section that time. And so I walk over and I see Elise and she's laying on the, on the bed and I put my finger by her and she just grabs my finger again. I'm like, oh, that's how. If you remember in uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the cartoon version, uh, and you see like when he starts being like good all of a sudden, and like you see his heart just like starts to grow bigger. That's what it was like for me loving my kids. It was like, oh, I love this girl with all my heart. And then guess what? My heart just got bigger to be able to love my second daughter. And it grows and it grows and it expands. And, and imagining that times 8 billion humans on earth now, and then all the ones who've lived before, God's heart is so big for you. And you just, he puts out his hand, and if you just would grab hold of his finger, your life would be changed forever. See, he loves. It's simple, but it's profound. Let us not skip the fact that God loves you. The second thing is that he gives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Shaylin uh, and some friends at her school have started to, um, well, they've liked Pokemon for a while. Anyone who likes Pokemon, it's okay if you admit it. Okay, just me, cool. Okay, so, um, uh, no, so we have some, you know, we have those uh, Pokemon cards and um, there's some kids who like to trade at the school, right? And so there's one boy in, in one of Shaylin's, in Shaylin's class that will say, would you like to have this card? And this is like a, like a metal VMAX. So if you know, it's, it's a pretty cool card. So, um, and if you don't, then just silently judge me. That's okay too. So, um, so it get, and this boy gives her a card and says, would you like it? She's like, are you, are you serious? Like to, like to keep? He's like, yeah, to keep. She said, yes, thank you so much. And so she takes it home, she has it, and she puts it in like a special sleeve, has it in a special spot inside her um, Pokemon binder. And then like a week later at school, he's like, can I have that card back? And she was like, what? Like, you know, like just this moment of, wait, what do you mean? And so she was talking to us about it. She's like, daddy, but, she, but he like gave it to me. And so like, I should just be able to keep it. And it's like, yes, but maybe he wasn't, you know, so trying to walk through that, that moment with her and she eventually gave it back. And then he wanted to give her a different card again. And so she's like, should I take it? Should I not take it? And it's this whole idea of when you're not sure of the giver, it's a lot harder to receive the gift. When you're not sure whether or not this gift is going to be something that's going to going to actually stay, or did you mean it, or are you trying to manipulate, or you try, whatever it may be. When we're not sure of the giver, it makes us harder to receive the gift. And so we can say God gave us his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would perish and not, would not perish and have eternal life. But we need to take hold of the fact that he gives it and he's not taking Jesus away from us. I mean, he physically was ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, but he lives and he's with us. And it's the reminder that when God gives something like that, someone like Jesus, we know we can trust the giver. Now, we don't know the amount of days we have on this life. We don't know what that looks like. And so there's also verses in Job, right, when it says the Lord gives and he takes away. So we know, we have breath, we have things, we have whatever it may be. And so yes, God can give and take away, but he will never, he, he doesn't remove what Jesus did on the cross. That gift is a gift that lasts for eternal life. That gift is one that we don't have to worry about the character of the giver because it's the giver of God, the Father, who while we were still sinners demonstrated his own love for us in this, that he gave his son to us. And then it's the character of Jesus, God the Son, the one who laid down his life. It wasn't taken from him. He laid it down so that his sheep would be able to have eternal life. And he is our good shepherd. See, John 3.16 starts off with what God did for us. What he does and who he is, he loves. And then he gives 
That's why when we give to someone else, it's better to give than to receive. It's because when we are, we are created in the image of an extravagant giver. We are created in the image of someone who gave so much for us, even when we didn't deserve it. And so when we are able to give to others, whether it's time, whether it's treasure, whether it's using our talents, whether, whatever it may be, when we are able to give to others, we are so much in the image of God. We've said it before that you can't outgive God, but he loves it when we try. When we want to have the heart of generosity, the heart of abundance, the heart of being able to see God multiply rather than a heart of scarcity, of hoarding and holding back. So God gives. He loves, he gives. So then what does that mean for us? The second, or excuse me, the third thing is that if God loves, God gives, and then we believe we believe. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. One of the things I saw um, that Max talks about is he, he takes a moment to look at the whoever idea. Friends, that's a small word with great impact. It means that it doesn't matter where you've come from, it doesn't matter what you've believed or not believed in your past. It doesn't mean where you've been, what you've experienced, what hardships you've faced. It doesn't matter what your home looked like when you were a child. It didn't matter what it is that your career is or isn't. It doesn't matter where, whether the life has turned out the way you wanted it to be or not. Whoever believes in Jesus, regardless of all those things, whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. You don't need to make yourself perfect before coming to Jesus. We, when we have people over for dinner, it's, Steph does a great job of making our home just such a hospitable place to be in. So it's very clean, very nice. And, you know, it's, it's me kind of for about an hour just not messing it up until people come, right? Like it's just recognize she does a great job and works so hard and the, we all chip in. We don't need to make ourselves clean to welcome Jesus into our hearts. When he stands at the door and knocks, he's not looking for a perfect household. He's looking for someone who wants to have a relationship with him. See, when we, whoever you are, and whatever you've experienced, all are welcome to experience eternal life through Jesus Christ. First John 2 talks about how he didn't just die for yours, since he died for the sins of the whole world. So, Again, it's wrapping our minds around the vastness of God, the intimacy with which he loves us, and yet the vastness of his sacrifice to invite us into the intimate relationship with him. And it's a verse that's 26 words long, but it has so much impact for us. Now, maybe some are, are wrestling and kind of thinking through, well, yeah, I, I've believed that before. Like, I know what it says, and I get what it's talking about. And so, yes, I've believed that Jesus, you know, Jesus is who he says he is. And James gives us a very interesting dynamic when it talks about belief and whether belief in the regards to like an intellectual assent of what Jesus is, whether that is enough. Here's why. Because he talks about how you believe that Jesus got good. Even the demons, demons do and they shudder. What does that tell us? That tells us that we can have the right theology, knowing that Jesus is God, and yet it's not, it doesn't mean that we have a right relationship with God through him. We can know the right things, but if our belief is purely an intellectual, reasonable ascent to ascending to the knowledge of who Jesus is, and that's where it stops, then we may not be any different than those who approach Jesus in Matthew 7 and say, you know, when I came to you, I said, Lord, Lord. He says, get away from me. Why? I never knew you. We can believe the right things, but if we don't have a right relationship, it's, 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 it's an intellectual understanding rather than a relational life-giving dynamic. So, when we, when we look at this, John 17, verse 3, it's not on the screen, but it talks about how this is eternal life, that you know God the Father and the Son who was sent by him. 
eternal life ends and starts and ends with knowing who God is and knowing him. In that Matthew 7 passage when everybody like, oh, we did all these great things for you and, and we did all this stuff. And Jesus says, I, didn't, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. And it reminds me of the fact that I would rather be known well by God than well known by men. Being well-known and famous by people and then not knowing Jesus and God the Father through Jesus. See, our world, our lives, in comparison to all of history, is like a 24-hour trip in our own bubble, in our own world. And it's, it's, a, it's a breath. It's a, it's a hair's breadth throughout all of eternity. We are here today, we are gone tomorrow. Life is like a mist. But instead of that being something that's discouraging, reminds us that if we only have one life to live, then we want to make sure we follow the one who had one life to give and he loves us so much that he did. So when we believe, it means that we recognize that God loves us, but that we blew it. There is sin in my life and your life all throughout that permeates human history. There is sin, there is brokenness. And if we don't get right with Jesus Christ, then we see in John 3, 16 that there's a chance that there's perishing, a separation eternally from God. And so we recognize God loves us, we blew it, but then at the right time and the right moment, Jesus paid for it. He's the one that opened the door. He's the one that paid the bill. He's the one that cashed the check. He's the one that took all of our sin, that all of our sin went off of our hook and went onto his hook at the cross. We talked about that last week. But here's the thing. You can know steps one, two, and three. God loves us. We blew it. Jesus paid for it. You can know those three and still be outside of the kingdom of God. Why? Because the fourth part is we must receive him. We have to enter into the relationship rather than just know there's an offer for a relationship. So he loves, he gives, we believe, and lastly, we live. We have eternal life. Not because of anything we've done, not because of anything we can earn, not because of our resume or our portfolio, not because of our 401k, not because of how many gold stars we got as a child, no matter, it's not about that. We live and we have eternal life, the life that allows us to face the ups and downs, the storms, the mountains, the valleys, the tragedies, the triumphs, because it's not based on our performance. It's based on who Jesus is. For God so loved the world, the last focus on this one, he so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, when we think of eternal life, when I often have thought originally about eternal life, I often think about like what happens when we die. And so, you know, there are times when we've gone to maybe crusades or, or, or tent revivals or um, sermons when it's like, if, if you die tonight, would you know where you're going? And, and there's a reason to decide here and now if you believe in Jesus. But if we look at it only that way, it can almost seem like we're only following Jesus to not go to hell, to not be perishing, not to go to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. But instead, it's when Jesus says, this is eternal life. It's knowing God and the son who was sent by him. Friends, that's something that happens now. This is not about the then. Eternal life is now and forever. It's both and. It's the fact that in John, as my original sermon was to look at different passages, different verses from John 1, 3, 5, 6, 10, and 17. But I'm like, let's, let's shorten it up. Let's keep it simple. But when you look at that, it talks about how in John 6, there's a section where it says, if you believe, you shall have eternal life, which implies future. 
And then seven verses later, in verse 37, he says, everyone who believes has eternal life, which implies now. So if we only think that we follow Jesus so that we don't go to hell, it's going to allow us to think that we can have a, forgive the phraseology, but a, a get out of hell free card. And that's not what this is. This is a relationship. This is the fact that you can have a brand new life now, that you can have eternal life, a life that is everlasting, a life that can navigate the ups and the downs and the valleys and the hills and the tragedies and the triumphs now. It's the kind of life that shows us that there's value now. And if we wait, friends, yes, we don't know the days of our lives, but I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. I'm trying to show you how much Jesus loved you into relationship with him. He loves. He gives. We believe and then we live. We live as new creations. As brand new people. Not as better caterpillars, but as butterflies. That idea of being transformed. The old is gone, the new has come. That idea of metamorphosis. We're not better caterpillars than we were before. We're butterflies. We're able to f- be brand new creations. In his, in his uh, commentary, Warren Wearsby has a quotation I want to close us with. And he says, Eternal life is not something we earn by character or conduct. Again, we can't clean up the house enough and say, okay, God, now I've earned eternal life because I'm good enough. No, it is a gift we receive by admitting we are sinners, repenting. For for that verbiage, repent, if you're unfamiliar, I would love to unpack it. It's the idea of you're going in a direction and repenting is literally just a stopping and making a 180. It's going and turning back. In this case, if we're walking away from God, a repenting is a moment where you stop and you turn back to God and you start your, your direction back towards him. So when we admit we are sinners, we repent, we turn around, and then we believe on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So eternal life is not for the then. It's not just for heaven and hell. We can live for now with eternity in mind which then allows us to be the kind of people that share with those, no matter how different they are, that whoever we come into contact with, realize that Jesus came, that whoever would believe in him, no matter how many differences we may have with those around us, the similarities that we have is that we are loved by God, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, what unites us is far stronger than what divides us. There's a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's at the end, and and we're going to close with this um, verse. Um, It's at the end of Deuteronomy. Moses in Deuteronomy, he gives a sermon, and he explains all the ways that God has showed up, and he reminds the people as they're about to enter into the promised land um, about God's faithfulness, about the covenant promises. And what he talks about at the very end is that he calls them into a, re- a renewal of the covenant. And he says this, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses. In Deuteronomy or in any ancient Near East um, culture, you needed two witnesses in order for a covenant to be valid. So he says, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, And this is the plea. Now choose life. Why? So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Friends, each and every one of us, we face temptations every single day in which we could choose death or, or giving into our sin because the wages of sin is death or we choose life. In every single interaction when someone wrongs us, we have the opportunity to choose death, the ways of the flesh and the sinful nature, or choose life. And for some of us, perhaps the greatest choice we still need to make is you may understand that Jesus loves you that God loves you. You may understand that he gave his only son. You may understand that we can believe in him, but have you 
cross that line into faith to choose life. The kind of life that we can't stay in our bubble, we can't stay in our own world without seeing the tragedies, the difficulties that are beyond our own lives, and yet the only hope we can have in the midst of what we experience, what we see around this world, is not in any person that is here on earth. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. He's like the hope that anchors our souls. And when it comes to what it looks like to follow him, it's like it said in that last um, quote, it's admit we're sinners. It's believing that he did what he did for us, and it's confessing Jesus is Lord. And when anyone here does that, it's like God is reaching out and you're holding on to his finger. And it changes everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for each person who hears my voice, whether they're in person, whether they're um, watching online, whether they're listening later, watching later. God, I pray that all of us would remember the, the, the simplicity and the beauty of John 3, 16, and may we not get um, distracted by the familiarity of it. God, because we never want something to become so familiar that it loses its power. And that goes for these verses, and that goes for our relationship with you. So Lord, I pray that as we, um, I pray for each person that, Lord, if there's anyone here or watching online or listening that needs to be returned to these verses, God, that you would remind us of how much you love, you give, that we can believe and we live. For anyone who's never crossed into that relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them now. And I pray that even in the depths of their hearts, they would just admit that they're sinners, that they would confess their belief, Jesus, that you came and you lived a perfect life, and you died a horrible death, but you paid the price through that death so we could have eternal life because we can't earn it. God, I pray there would be people whose lives are changed, that they would choose this day to choose life, life with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Another thing that we do very often that can, maybe familiarity can, has the potential to cause us to lose the power of it, is that we get to take communion every single week. And we, this is not just a transitional moment in our service. This is not just a, oh, just like, oh, it just goes in one ear out the other. Let's just take communion. That's what we do. When, I was at, when we went to the Grand Canyon, Steph and I, um, a few years ago, before we had Shaylin, I remember we were in the bus, the tour bus, and as we were driving around, and, and we got to the point where you saw the Grand Canyon for the first time, and it was just breathtaking, if you've ever been there. Just amazing. You go out and we took pictures and we went around and, and you know, got to just enjoy that. Then we get back in and we go to another stop and there's another lookout and people take pictures and you go out and do it. By the third time, I remember we were in there uh, in the bus and we're stopping on our third turnout and someone was like, okay, let's go ahead and get out. We walk out and someone was like, oh, I've, I've seen it now. I've seen it before. And you're like, how do we allow familiarity to rob us of power. Friends, for those of us who know and love Jesus, who've crossed that line into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who have that relationship with him, and he's our Lord, he's our Savior, he's our leader, we take communion each and every week, not because it's just the next stop on our church tour of the service today. We take it because it reminds us. We do this in remembrance of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. We remind ourselves that we could not pay the price on our own, and Jesus willingly did it for us. It reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. So friends, we take the bread this morning that reminds us of his body that was battered, broken, bruised, and torn. We take the cup that reminds us of his blood that was poured out. We do so in remembrance. 
we do so with repentance and we do so with reassurance. And no matter whoever we are, whatever we've done, all are welcome at the cross of Christ in a relationship with him. Please feel free to partake of the bread and the cup as you feel led.